climate debate. Once again, European leaders have met here in Paris to talk about the skyrocketing youth unemployment. It's the latest in a flurry of meetings and measures since German, German Chancellor Angela Merkel said the issue was the most pressing facing the continent. But despite all of their efforts, the jobless rate still continues to rise and today's meeting, as we expected, managed to offer little in terms of fixing Europe's youth unemployment rate, which now stands at around 23.5%. And of course, just to give you some idea of comparison, in the United States, that rate is around 16%. So have we passed the point of no return for Europe's lost generation? Here to talk about it with me is Bastien Lacoz, a young entrepreneur and co-founder of Les Moineaux, a network which represents the interests of people like himself, young entrepreneurs. Matthias Feckel, a socialist uh, member of the parliament. Alexander Still, a contributor to The New Yorker, who's currently based here in Paris, and Franz Van Kat's very own Europe editor, Christoph Rebeet. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining me. And a reminder that you, the viewer, can send in your tweets to tell us what you think about this via the hashtag F24Debate. So let me start uh, we were with you, Christopher, uh, Christoph. Rather. We were talking before the break about the need to sort of make it easier for employers to employ young people and cheaper possibly. Um, what else needs to be done, in your opinion? Well, th there is also a problem of liquidity for a lot of SMEs. I recently travelled to Greece. Uh, you know, actually in Athens, you find a lot of very vibrant SMEs, particularly in the uh, uh, internet uh, sector. Uh, but what I tell you is, look, we have brilliant ideas, our products are popular, but when we want to expand, when we want to hire more, more people, we run out of money. We don't have liquidity. So the banking crisis, uh, strengthening European banks is part of the solution. That was acknowledged by uh, uh, all EU leaders today. Uh, and that's obviously why the European Investment Bank is part of this uh, sort of uh, uh, plan to stimulate uh, youth unemployment. So I think there is a problem there to look at. Um, Matthias, uh, we were talking also in the first part about the problems with the education system here in France, which, as we were saying, tends to be rather old-fashioned and not geared towards providing students with skill sets for the 21st century. I mean, as well as reforming the labour market, that's one thing that needs to be looked at closely, isn't it? There's a need to reform the orientation process, but there are also lots, uh, lots of things that are done. And I think the national education system has, ver has changed much more than it's sometimes said. I see it on my, in my constituency, sorry, but it's on the local level that, that you see what happens. For example, we um, worked on uh, something so that uh, young people from lotte Garonne can uh, find jobs in the aeronautic um, sector because there are, we know that for the next years and maybe even more there will be growth, there will be jobs, there are perspectives to have great and interesting jobs and careers and so we try to bring them to these sectors and not to sectors where there's no future at all. And so there are local initiatives uh, that work. Uh, and that have to be expanded. Um, Alexander, it's all very good to be able to quote Voltaire at the end of your high school, but uh, education, but is that going to get you a job at the end of the day? Well, I think that, that what is clear is that France had a, adopted an educational model that was kind of based on a 19th century idea of culture and of um, excellence, uh, which then became excessively rigid and is still incredibly centralized. It's amazing to me that uh, in every school in France, everyone goes to school on the same day. Uh, Napoleon used to say he could look at his watch and know what everyone and every lycée in France was studying, and that's still remarkably true. You see how much difficulty even uh, the current government had in changing what they called the rythme scolaire, you know, to go to school on Wednesday, which makes obvious pedagogic sense, but even so, they only go to 12.30. Uh, these they immediately encounter stiff resistance from uh, unions of teachers and things of that kind, and it's still um, so that changing those things is very very difficult in the in the in the French system, and I think needs to be thought of. It's it, to me it's very curious that 
um, coming at it as a relative newcomer, uh, how conservative French society is. Here is a here is a country that is run by a socialist government, but nobody would think that you know that you still have to get a notebook that is exactly the same number of pages. Uh, everybody has to have a fountain pen with the same colored inks and all this. It's it's extremely codified, and one has to be able to kind of shake it up and say, well, have we learned something in the last hundred years about education that would cause us to rethink the way in which we do things? Is it possible for school in one region of France to, to try something different and take a different approach to education and see whether we could learn from that experiment. Those things are very, very difficult to do in a highly centralized system like France, and so I think it's worth uh, worth discussing, but uh, I wouldn't bet a lot of money on it changing. Bastien, you're grinning there, because it's obviously not that long ago that you were in a, a classroom. Definitely. I think French school is there to build humans uh, and we have a, a system that is like it is and it they want to teach us how to speak good French, how to do good mathematics and this is really important and today we have less, the teacher has less and less uh, hours in school to teach mathematics and, uh, and French and we, we are losing what we should have kept, should, should have kept. Um, but you're right on something, I think the, the method that we use today at school is not the good one. Uh, I work in many schools. I have a nonprofit that uh, works on the orientation in the suburbs, and we realize that uh, students are sometimes bored during uh, their lessons. So th there's a real hi issue on this. But um, I think the the real problem is uh, the in the last generation is the youth who, who's my age, who are my age, like between t 20 years old and 30 years old, not the one who who are 10, and we'll see for them later. Uh, the, the real issue is, is right now, and it's, it's what we can do right now to help uh, to help the youth. How, in your opinion, how much of what we're seeing, in, and obviously here in France, but also, I mean, we need to think about this applying to across Europe, how much of this is caused by a uh, restrictive labour market? Um, I think the first problem is not unemployment in Europe these days is the growth. So when there's no growth, there's no employment. But what is true is al also that uh, it's too complicated to hire people in France. We always say this. We always I have been hearing this since I was five years old, and it's, it remains true. I try to hire people these days in, for my company, and I realize how complicated it, it is because the system is done for big companies, not for small companies. When you create your, uh, your company, you don't know what you will do in three months you, because you have no contracts, uh, no clients yet when you create your company and you have to hire someone in CDE and in three months you cannot... We, we have to just explain for what a CDE is, which is a permanent contract as opposed to a CDD, which is a short-term contract. And part of the problem has been, isn't it, Christophe, that many places uh, such as France and Spain and Italy, a lot of people, young people rather, have been offered short-term contracts, not permanent positions. And, uh, for instance, here in the case of France, you can't even get a loan or a mortgage when you're uh, employed on a uh, short-term contract. Uh, absolutely. But having said it, I think that uh, people with a short-term contract will always be more happy than unemployed people. Uh, but you're right that the labour market in Europe is extremely uh, rigid if you compare it uh, with the uh, American system or even with uh, the Scandinavian or the British system. Um, is it... All parts of the problem. There's also, of course, a problem of competitiveness. If your company is not competitive, uh, you're not going to be able to uh, hire people. And I agree with you when you say the problem is growth. And this is why unemployment, and particularly youth unemployment, because young people are the most vulnerable uh, citizens in Europe, are affected by this crisis. It all starts uh, with an uh, with, with a financial crisis, a debt crisis, which turned into an economic crisis. And now is the time, of course, to break this vicious circle. But there is one question. Where is the money? Where will you get the money to fund all these, uh, all these uh, projects? Matthias, do you obviously, have the answer? Obviously, uh, if everybody agrees that there's a problem of growth, uh, there has to be a priority on growth. And Europe has to become, again, uh, an element of growth and not only an element of austerity. And so it's, it's, I think it's a very important decision that there is the priority on youth, that there is also priority on, political, in, on industrial policy, uh, because otherwise uh, Europe will not, um, will not last forever. And I think that this is what European leaders finally now understood and 
uh, President Hollande has been pushing for this uh, since he, he was elected. I would just one point because I completely agree with one thing uh, Bastien Lecoz said. It's uh, the focus on small and uh, medium business. In France, everything, uh, every law uh, is uh, done for big business because we have a tradition of colbertisme, so uh, state very influ influential in industrial policy and in big national companies. And too often we forget the uh, specific uh, difficulties and specific environment of small business. I think there's a very interesting uh, uh, path to follow and very inter interesting things to be done. Um, to, to have more growth and to have to trust uh, these guys in the businesses who do their best and and um, for them it's often very difficult to follow all the changes and all the legislation. Well, here's a tweet from one of our viewers, uh, Timothy Katamonga, who says European industries are relocating to third world countries because the wages are so low compared to the European youth. So Europe is now paying the price. Alexander, what would you say to that? Well, I don't know about it. I mean, um, wages in, in Germany are quite high, and yet um, unemployment is relatively low. I don't know that wages are always the thing one wouldn't want to see. Uh, I mean, on the one hand, as I said, clearly greater flexibility in the labor market is involved, and that may mean, I mean, I think wages have been lowered in Germany. Uh, and that's been a factor in um, in their maintaining high levels of employment. Uh, but wages are quite high in some of the Scandinavian countries, and yet their unemployment levels are. Uh, but I think flexibility is is perhaps more important. For example, Denmark pushed through reforms that made it much easier to fire people, but the people are not simply kicked to the street; they are looked after. So, but it it takes the onus off of the business. Uh, the business then has the flexibility to hire and fire as, as economic needs require. And that seems to me a, a very obvious principle that, uh, to, to running a business well. Uh, Christoph, I mean, we were talking earlier about how the French and the British are somewhat uh, sceptical about the Germans for the fact that they don't have a national minimum, minimal wage. And as a result, they rely on a lot of uh, East European labour to come in and uh, basically do those low-level jobs, don't they? Yes, you're right. Germany doesn't have a national minimum wage. You have minimum wages agreed by sector and by region. Uh, Germany, unlike France, is an extremely decentralised country. Uh, <coughs> now, this is likely to change uh, with the new government because, as you know, we're heading for a grand coalition between the Conservatives and the Social Democrats. And one of the conditions has been to have some sort of national wage. Don't expect a French-style uh, minimum wage, sorry, minimum wage. But these things will change. But you're right to say that there is a great deal of resentment in France and in Belgium because uh, Germany has been relying very heavily on cheap labour force from Romania, from Poland, People who are very happy to work in Germany, and of course, thanks to EU laws, they're allowed to work in Germany. And this is creating uh, what the French have called le dumping social, social dumping. Now, the French would like to change this, but what the Germans will tell you is, why don't you do, why don't you do the same? You know, why don't you try to attract skilled workers from Eastern Europe who are ready to work in France, uh, maybe for lower wages. Matthias, uh, when you hear what Christoph has to say about what's going on with Germany and Germany then turning around to other European countries and say, why don't you do the same, do you think they're being heard by uh, other European leaders? France is not Germany, so we will certainly not do exactly the same. And I don't think Europe is to be, every country has to do exactly the same reforms and the same decisions. When you look at Germany today, there's one thing is very interesting. You have the sector which is the sector of services with very low wages, and there's no international um, um, con concurrence, competition. Uh, competition, sorry. And then you have the sector of the industry and the sector which is very competitive and where you have uh, competition. And in this sector, the wages are much higher than they are in France because Germany has been able to uh, upgrade its production, to be on very high level production, to be on innovation, to be on exportation. And this is a thing France has to do, of course. Um, but so I agree when, when you say that uh, the question of low wages is not the solution. When you see what makes Germany success today, uh, the, the greatest successes are in the, um, in the sectors 
where they, ha they are able to pay higher wages because uh, they do great products and great, uh, and great innovations. And they make the most of uh, the globalized world we live in. Germans are very happy to sell their products to the Chinese, the Indians, uh, the Russians. And that's very much ingrained in, 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 in the German uh, mentality, that you have to fight for the markets and you always have to be the best. And you're right, Germans rely heavily on SMEs, small and medium-sized companies, often run by families. They've been run by the same family for decades. And these companies are able to invest a lot in research and development, which explains why they're able to, as you said, upgrade the quality of their products. Um, Alexander, how can European politicians sell a future to young people these days who are less and less likely to find a job? Well, I think, it, again, it depends on the country. Uh, there are many parts of, I mean, one, one should also keep things in relative terms. Most countries in Europe are wonderful places to live. Uh, quality of life is very high. But what's true is that the very low growth in a number of the countries is a serious threat to the future. Um, and um, so I think, for example, I, I know Italy very well, where there really is a deep crisis, uh, where the, the society really has to think through what is it that we want to do and how are we going to get there, because in the last 20 years um, that path has been, uh, has been lost. Um, I think, unfortunately, whether one likes it or not, competitiveness on an economic level is part of that solution. You can't get around it you, because growth seems to be essential to being able to provide opportunities is not just providing wealth, but it's also providing mobility. Societies that uh, don't grow are, are uh, remarkably immobile and stratified, and no one, I think, wants that. And we're moving toward that. And so uh, looking at formulas for growth, and here one would need an economist rather than me, but there are, are, are policies that have favored growth. I think the question of austerity needs to be discussed more. One of the things that um, uh, you had mentioned was that uh, you know, Europe has lived largely sort of under the, uh, the, the policies adopted by Germany, Germany being the strongest economic player, has been able to kind of call the tune. And um, austerity has not served Europe tremendously well. Um, and looking at policies that favor uh, growth needs to be part of the discussion. Um, uh, but I think growth and competitivity at the same time, uh, uh, competitiveness also has to be a factor. And Bastian, young people are voting with their feet, aren't they? Because there are more and more young people who are heading elsewhere and leaving places, countries such as France. Yeah, that's a sad um, thing we see, but maybe they're going to go somewhere else and, and bring new things to France. Uh, we see this a lot in France, but uh, only in people who can pay the price to go somewhere else. Because when you go in Argentina or in, uh, in Hong Kong or anyway, uh, you need to pay the ticket then to live a little bit there to find a job. And uh, it's always the same. We'll stay in, in France, the people who have uh, not the good contact, not the good uh, uh, family, and they will continue to be poorer and poorer. So it's, uh, there's a big issue on uh, people going uh, in other country. But I think it's not uh, the main uh, the main problem. Just one thing. I think my generation um, really wants some huge changes. Uh, we saw what the limits of the uh, st state um, état providence uh, welfare, state. welfare mm -hmm. state. Sorry, <laughs> of the welfare state in many uh, in many fields uh, on social security on uh, on. Um, helps that you get when you're unemployed and we don't want so much security anymore I think we are ready to uh, live with more risk my generation I think and, um, and so we're ready to change a little bit the, the model we have in France right now Christoph, um, for both President Hollande and Angela Merkel, this was uh, not just a summit to talk about youth unemployment. It was also a very important strategic move on their part. Uh, on, in the case of the French leader, of course, this is a man who's battling low popularity yeah. ratings. Um, and then, of course, on Angela Merkel's side, she needs to appear that she's not indifferent to the plight of those who are unemployed. You're right. I think they were both counting on this summit, this conference, for different reasons. Francois Hollande, as you mentioned, uh, his approval rating has hit a, a historic low at 21%. It means that barely one in five French trusts François Hollande. Uh, so he was using this conference to say, look, I am fighting uh, 
for jobs. And I am indeed uh, shifting the focus away from austerity to growth. Now, for Angela Merkel, who is extremely popular at home, it was an opportunity uh, to tell to Europe's southern countries, Spain, Italy, that she is not indifferent, that she cares about uh, the future of Europe and youth unemployment. And I think she does care a lot, as all leaders, because you mentioned a revolution. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, they may not expect a revolution in the coming years, but we see in Greece with the rise of Golden Dawn, a neo-Nazi party supported um, partly by young people. Uh, look at um, Italy, uh, there is, and look at France, I mean, there is uh, social unrest, people are on edge, they don't trust their leaders, they don't have faith in the future, so this was an opportunity for leaders to, to show that they have maybe some solutions to offer. And uh, as we were just saying there, this is an important summit for the French leader and one person who's been looking online at the reaction to President Hollande recently, as I was just pointing out, who's suffering from low popularity ratings, is none other than Media Watch's James Creedon. And what have you found? Evening, Annette. Well, it's one of the big uh, topics of conversation in French media today, that poll showing, which came out yesterday, in fact, for Ipsos and Le Point Newsweekly, showing 21% popularity ratings for François Hollande. That's a drop, Annette, from 26% percent last October, which was already an historic low. This is the lowest popularity ratings of a president uh, ever in the Fifth Republic. Now, that's the same for Jean-Marc Ayrault, the Prime Minister, also at 21 percent approval ratings. So a lot of people saying, really, is it time to have a government reshuffle, which is one of the main tools at François Hollande's disposal to try to get those popularity ratings up. Now, one MP who asked for that, who called for that, is a Socialist Party MP, uh, Malek Bouti. It is urgent to replace Jean-Marc Ayrault, he said. That is uh, the Prime Minister within his own uh, government and his own uh, party. So a lot of people unhappy about that and tweeting, saying, well, maybe we should get rid of you urgently because this isn't a, a very uh, united approach for somebody in the Socialist Party. Now, elsewhere, um, there, the media is pointing, some media are pointing out that Jean-Marc Ayrault got a standing ovation when he arrived in the French Parliament this morning for a Socialist Party gathering. Uh, so he seems to have the support of his own MPs, but uh, will that be enough indeed if it's only 21% popularity ratings across the country? Some are saying he, uh, François Hollande might be obliged really to have that government reshuffle sooner rather than later. Now, according to several media today, he did have a secret launch with Martine Aubry, uh, not very just, secret, the media is talking secret, about it. it? Yes. Not secret anymore, but in any case, what's also interesting about that is Martine Aubry, a former head of the Socialist Party, a rival of François Hollande in the uh, primaries for the Socialist Party candidacy last year for the uh, presidential election. Uh, her people say, you know, they called us some 10 days ago, the presidential palace got in touch with us. Uh, the presidential palace for its part is saying, not at all, it was Martine Aubry uh, wanted this meeting with the president. So if they can't agree on that, I would say maybe it doesn't bode well for uh, for uh, working in a tandem with Martine Aubry. Now elsewhere, a lot of people looking towards uh, the interior minister as well, who is the most popular minister in the French cabinet, that is uh, Manuel Valls. He has 56% popularity ratings. He's well ahead of any of the other ministers, largely because he appeals to the political right and he can straddle uh, the left and the right in that sense. In any case, he has said he supports uh, Jean-Marc Ayrault. And uh, so for now, he's certainly uh, playing down any expectations that he might get that position. Some pointing towards the dynamic between Jacques Chirac and uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, who was his very popular interior minister back in the day. And uh, he didn't get the nod to be prime minister in that governor government re reshuffle because, you know, many saying a very popular a Prime Minister could be a threat to the President's authority. So yes. there you go, a lot of talk about a possible reshuffle. Yes, I was going to say, nothing like a younger, more popular minister snapping at the heels of the older political leaders. Indeed. Indeed. James Creedon, thank Thanks you so that. much for that. And at this point, I want to thank my guests, uh, Bastien Lacoz, uh, Alexander uh, Steele, uh, uh, Christophe Robit, and uh, Matthias Feckel for being my guests on this uh, debate. And you can stay with us because coming up after a short break will be uh, Laura Sell with more international news. That's it for the France Bank Cat Debate.